Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. This song was an inspiration to me when I was thinking about this talk. The song was written by James Weldon Johnson. And when I think about the idea of what the institution of the black church is as the focus of my academic research, it has been documented and it has been studied based on two things, the people and the events. Very little has been studied on the actual architecture, the actual church houses, the homes that supported the people and housed the events. So when I think about resistance and I think about resiliency, I've coupled those two terms together because I believe that they are applicable to the institution and the current condition of the African American church. This church that you see on the screen is ground zero for my research, First African Baptist Church. It was constructed in the mid-1850s, from 1855 to 1859, by enslaved people at night under the cover of darkness and by kerosene light. This church is in, located in Savannah, Georgia, and it was the home of the first church that was formed in 1773 on a river plantation about a couple of miles north of Savannah. And they made the claim that they are the oldest continuous African-American church in North America. So this is what the church looks like today. Uh, not much difference except it has a little stucco on it. But this church represents a variety of different types of architectural examples here that for African-Americans mean a great deal. Now, the great Mississippi author, uh, Richard Wright, wrote in 1941 on his book, 12 Million Black Voices, he made this quote, basically talking about what these four walls and what these spaces mean to us as African-Americans. So as we move forward past the Civil War, past uh, Reconstruction, into the latter part of the 19th century, and into the early years of the 20th century, a plethora of African-American church buildings, mainly in the South, were constructed, usually after the congregations were formed, maybe a year or two or a few years earlier, okay? But uh, once we got past uh, mainly the Civil War and enslavement, these buildings started to pop up. They were built in urban areas, they were built in rural areas, and they became the homes of the community, the African-American community. They're still the heart of the community today. So as we are looking at these, uh, these structures, they represented the opportunity for African-Americans to worship the way they wanted to, to, uh, to provide a variety of different services that supported the community. People were born in some of these houses. Uh, schools were run out of these churches. And as we began to look at these spaces, we began to understand and attempt to frame and define a concept that really is not a concept that is contemporary in nature. What is black space? This image represents uh, the, I, the, the concept of the hush harbor, the brush arbors. This is where African Americans, when, they were, when we were enslaved, stole away to a, an abandoned barn, a gully, uh, a forested area, under the cover of darkness, to try to understand two concepts that were presented to us. This Jesus person, what is Christianity? What does it mean to us? Something that was thrusted upon us as a result of our enslavement. And the attempt to reconcile that with Afrocentric spirit worship, typically uh, from West African nations, Central Sub-Saharan Africa, even as far away as East Africa. So the syncretization of these two concepts were the, began the foundation of the institution of the black church as we know it today. Preaching was created here in these spaces. The ability to express ourselves without the influence of a slave master or an overseer or, or, or even a, a white clergyman, okay? So in these spaces were formed the, the opportunity for us to begin to find ourselves and reconcile these two concepts to what we believe today to be a pretty good combination here. Uh, so what black space is, 
you could probably get a different idea, a different definition from anyone that you would ask that question to. But I think one universal point may well be that if I'm not sure how to put it in words, but I know it when I'm in it. Okay, this is Brown Chapel, the sanctuary of Brown Chapel. This place was the launching point for the historic Selma to Montgomery March back in 1965. This, this is the Woolworth College Chapel on Tougaloo College campus in Tougaloo, Mississippi. So these houses began to, as we move forward into the mid 20th century, begin to support the political movements and the planned activities for marches, for resistance uh, against the civil, uh, uh, in support of the civil rights movement as we move towards the middle of the century. Now, W.E.B. Du Bois in his book, the souls of black folks, talked about a concept called two-ness. This duality, something that African Americans experienced back in 1903 when the, Bush, when the book was published, and it basically uh, attempts to define the, uh, the challenges and the struggles that African Americans would have here then and now within the context of what this duality meant of being an American and being an African American. This concept was rolled into, it's discussed and celebrated into the idea of placemaking. Now this is a church that's just outside the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, and this church was built, at least in, the, in the, uh, the black and white image you see, in 1918. The color and set is the shot I took in 2017. From an architectural standpoint, not much has happened. But this was an example, just like many of these other churches all throughout the South, of the ability to take four walls in a room, turn it and transform it from a space to a place. So as we're moving forward to the middle of the 20th century, the civil rights movement is, movement is reaching its peak. The light is getting brighter and is lighting up these houses of worship. And as a result of the stronger influence that these houses of worship would have, this happens. The houses of worship will become targets. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. From 1822 to today, these church houses were under assault either through arson, bombings, or shootings. This church is the Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. This, had, this church has a history of resistance. This has a history of resilience. It was founded by Morris Brown, and was founded by, founded by Denmark Vesey. And this church was burned to the ground in the early 1820s when the black codes were put in place in Charleston, South Carolina that forbade African Americans from meeting in groups more than two, okay? Uh, and more recently, as you recall, a few years back, this church was unfortunately the site of a shooting in which nine individuals were murdered in the middle of uh, a midweek service, including a pastor of this church. In 1921, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the race riots destroyed in, in the entire area where African Americans lived. Uh, there were, among other casualties from an architectural standpoint, a number of churches that went down. Mount Zion, you see in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, was just two, or three, two to three months out from opening its doors as a brand new facility. And, the, and because of these riots, the church was literally taken down to its foundation. About 40 years later, the height of the Civil Rights Movement in Birmingham, Alabama, in September of 1963, a bomb went off in the 16th Street Baptist Church. Over 20 people were injured in that blast, which occurred on an early Sunday morning, right before the start of service, and four little girls were murdered. Yet with a steady beat, have, we, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. This idea of ownership represents the one thing that African Americans enslaved could never have, and that was the right to self-determine. So being able to build these four walls and frame them within a space to create a place for us represented ownership, and it represents control. It represented the opportunity for us to be able to do what we want within our place, within our space, which we have created. And as a result, a measure of an intense pride 
existed as a result of the construction of something we put together for ourselves. That goes a very long way to my studies here and presentations on trying to dis, uh, de determine the answer to a specific question. Are these churches sacred? Are they sacred spaces? This is the interior of First Africa Baptist Church. And this church, as you can see with these images on the, on the screen, became the first Afrocentric evidence, or one of the first uh, exercises of Afrocentric evidence here, of the influence of culture onto a black building. In this case, these stained glass windows represent the first six pastors of First African Baptist Church. These windows were installed in the middle of the 1880s, and they're still there today. So, uh, from a coupling of whether these spaces are sacred, and do these spaces reflect culture? Of course they do. So do they bring value to the space? I believe that they do. A space that is valued will be resilient. It will last over time. We have come over a way that with tears has, has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. The architect Anthony Lawler wrote in his book, the temple, of the, the temple in the House, about a concept between being alive, being human, and made a connection to an architectural concept of verticality and horizontality. And he expressed it in uh, terms that he called the steeple and the sanctuary. The idea is this, from a vertical perspective, humans have the desire, the innate desire, to want to know more, to be experienced, to learn more, maybe from a higher power, to get on one's knee, to pray about what the existence of life may be. What are we here for? Why are we here? Sometimes that become a little scary when you ask the question. But the challenge here is something that is innate in all of us, okay? The steeple represents that vertical reach to the heavens, okay? While we are taking that chance, of reaching for more, maybe more than what we ought to find out or more than what we ought to know, there is a comfort zone, a horizontal comfort zone that exists in the sanctuary, a place where you are loved, a place where you can be supported, a place that is nurturing for you. So this balance between the vertical and attempting to uplift, move forward uh, beyond what you are, and the risk that, might, that people might feel from, uh, from that effort uh, is balanced out with the idea that if you put these two concepts together, you create a complete person, a complete human, the idea of being alive. So, is there resiliency and resistance in these church buildings? Are they relevant? Yes, they are. They're still here, they're still standing. This is St. Augustine, Catholic Church, it was, it was completed, construction was completed in 1842, almost 180 years old. It's located in New Orleans in the Treme community. This is New Zion Baptist Church, it's located in Bessemer, Alabama. It was designed by a black architect, constructed by a black construction company at the turn of the last century. It's still there. And I'll end on this shot with ground zero for me, uh, the first African Baptist Church with the idea that from a resiliency perspective and a resistance perception, the institution of the black church and her church houses continue to exist. Shallowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God and true to our native land. Thank you very much.